Like this is a Saturday morning TV log from Big D's Entertainment Rankings and Reviews. Zoinks! Welcome to another Saturday morning TV log, and this time around it's a pup named Scooby-Doo, brought to us by Hanna-Barbera. Greetings, my fellow YouTubers. I'm Dual, the Big D. This, of course, is Big D's Entertainment Rankings and Reviews. So today's Saturday morning TV log is a pub named Scooby-Doo. Made in 1988 by Hanna-Barbera, it's a mystery comedy series. This is the eighth overall installment of Scooby-Doo. And depicts younger versions of the title character and his meddling kids of companions as they saw mystery similar to the original series. Tom Ruger, who recently worked on other Hanna Barbera tunes as well as shows for Rival Studio Filmation, and of course would later go on to work for Warner Brothers on Batman the Animated Series, Tiny Two Adventures, Animaniacs, and many others. Which that was a real summon. Originally premiering on ABC in September of 1988, the show was one of my childhood favorites. <laughs> Along with most of Hanna Barbera's production staff, Mr. Ruger departed from the studio after the first season. Don Lusk, a longtime animator for the for Disney and Bill Melendez Animation Studios, you know Bill Melendez, the Animation Studios is the company that gave us the. Charlie Brown and Snoopy show and the Peanuts game tunes took over as the director. Now, Pub Named Scooby Doo was the last version of the series in the franchise in which Don Masick once again voiced the title character before he passed away in 1997, and one of the few in the franchise in which someone other than Frank Welker voiced, well, the leader of the gang, Fred Jones. Now, now m most of the voice actors are child actors. Carl Steven took over the role of Freddy. Voicing Daphne is Kelly Martin, who also would appear, who after the first season would also go on to appear in the cult classic Troop Beverly Hills, and also appeared in, let's see, I, I know it was um, one of the, oh, hang on just a second, let me see. Oh yeah, Runaway Ralph. Yeah, which came out the same year, as a matter of fact. Oops. Oh yeah, she also would voice Roxanne in a Goofy movie. And Christina Lang voiced Velma, who, well, doesn't talk all the time, but she will at times, including saying her famous catchphrase, Jinkies. But, um, aside from Masick, the only other person to return was Casey Kasem, who once again voiced Shaggy Rogers. Anyway. Now, this series was, well, another attempt to create younger versions of characters after the success of Jim Henson's Muppet Babies and the Flintstone Kitsch, which was a recent hit for the studio, which I think just happened to have been cancelled the same year this came out. I think I might have been wrong. I may be wrong, though. I think they were re-airing that show. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they brought that back for reruns during this show's first season. Anyway. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, it was good to have some of these, the, the whole cast back as... Children now. I mean, it brought Fred and Velma back after being absent from them for the last few years because they didn't appear in much of the Scooby Doo Scrappy Doo run. Which, even though I was going to talk about that, but I put that on, I shelved it for now. I mean, even though they did appear in a few episodes of the new Scooby Doo Mysteries in 1984. Anyway, now this new show also used the same basic formula of the original series. The Scooby-Doo Detective Agency, a forerunner of Mystery Incorporated, solved supernatural-based mysteries in the town of Coolsville. Where, of course, the monsters of the week are always revealed as bad guys in masks and costumes. The biggest difference was the tone of the show. With this series, producer Tom Ruger built upon the slightly irreverent humor he had established along with producer Mitch Schauer, with Scooby's recent um, series. 
the 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, which that had ended a couple of years back. So it brought Scooby in the game back after a two-year absence. Well, anyway, which, of course, 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo was a little unsuccessful. This resulted in a wackier, more extremely comic version of Scooby-Doo that satirized, you know, satire, the conventions of the show's previous incarnations. It was not uncommon for the characters to do wild takes Avery or Bob Clampett-esque takes when they ran to the Ghosts and Monsters. Animation director and overseas supervisor Glenn Candy animated many of the wild take sequences personally. Fred was constantly blaming a character appropriately called Red Herring, who is a major nuisance. It's a pun on Red Herring. For each and every crime on the show, true to his name, was always innocent, except for Night of the Boogie Biker, the one episode in which Fred didn't even blame him. And shots of the characters, and even the monsters, were dancing inserted into the pop rock music score chase sequences. The, the show actually had music sequences, just like just like the second season of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? But, of course, this had the gang dancing and what have you, and soon the monsters would be joining as well. Anyway, the monsters themselves were also more comedic, such as a creature made out of molten cheese, which that's actually from one of my favorite episodes of the series that, and that, of course, was, was Wanted Cheddar Alive, a monster in the form of a giant hamburger. That was from one of my least favorite episodes, Night of the Living Hamburger, and the Ghost of a Dog Catcher. I think I remember that one. I, I forgot what episode that was, so bear with me. The series also features Scooby and Shaggy as their favorite superhero duo. Of course, Shaggy would be the fearless Commander Cool, a combination of both Batman and Superman. And Scooby would be his faithful canine sidekick, Mellow Mutt, a combination of Crypto the Super Dog, Ace the Bat Town, and Robin the Boy Wonder. Yeah. Now. Now, actually, uh, now Shaggy is like his older incarnation. He said like and zoinks constantly. Let's see. Scooby behaved like the older version. Of, except, of course, when giving a Scooby snack, when he goes, once he gets one, mm, and, or similar in an exaggerated manner, rock into the air, sometimes literally. Yeah. Then float back down to the ground, similar to Snuffles' reaction after consuming a dog biscuit. Again, in the quick draw McGraw cartoons. Now there are some differences between them, between the others. There's Daphne, she's more of a vain young girl who was quite skeptical and sarcastic, especially towards Fred. Being born to money, she often called to her butler Jinky, Jenkins upon Jinkies. That actually happened when Velma said Jinkies in one episode for help. On occasion, Scooby would call for him instead, like in the episode Horror of the Haunted Hairpiece. Usually for incredibly silly reasons. Something she does not to do while older, despite still being fabulously wealthy. She often accused the wrong person who did the crime only by her intuition. She also had deep infatuation with the color pink. Opposing older Daphne who prefers everything in purple, preferring most of her clothes and personal possessions in said color and treats fashion as life and death. She also hates getting new boots, dirty and Blah, blah, blah. You know, the, you know the story if you've seen the show. Now, as for Fred, he's always outspoken and always jumps to the wrong conclusion. Aside from accusing Red Herring and what have you, his runaway imagination often annoyed the rest of the gang by looking at his favorite magazine, The National Exaggerator, which his uncle gains ownership of during the course of the series. Anyway, he often offered a ludicrously hypothet hypothesis for the mystery in question, which usually involves anything from nonfiction. However, he can get the point at times. Now, Velma was mostly the same as her older incarnation, intelligent and soft-spoken with thick eyeglasses. The most evident change to her character was that she owned a briefcase-sized mobile computer that could determine who the culprit was in any particular era episode. She also owned an oversized engine-propelled skateboard with a color scheme similar to the Mystery Machine, which all the characters could ride on. And she had a distinctive gait during longer walks or runs, rapidly shuffling feet 
and a distinctive dance style borrowed from Peanuts characters, character five actually, um, as he appears during the dance scene in a Charlie Brown Christmas. Anyway, yeah, let's see them. The music's really good. It's ro it's rock and roll style songs, specifically about the monster of the week. Now, unlike previous versions of the show, the kids were often aware of the music being played. Having turned on themselves in many occasions, and would dance for a bit along with the ghosts and monsters before continuing with the chase. Now, Glenn Kennedy would often animate the character dance cycles himself. Now, the show's theme song featured lyrics by creator Tom Ruger and music by composer John Debney. Also bore a similarity to the intro song from Little Shop of Horrors, which had recently been adapted into a successful feature film. The music is almost always in a 1950s rock and roll style, possibly to indicate their younger age, as the original show took place in 1969. But anyway, yep. This show's absolutely a blast, and I really do love the show. Now, okay, let me see. I can get to some of my favorite, other favorite episodes. Now, there's also the Schnook Who Took My Comic Book. That's a good episode. And For Letter or Worse, good one. Now Museum, Now You Don't. Snow Place Like Home, Scooby Dude. Let's see here. Lights, Camera, and Monster isn't too bad. Oh, now I think I'm... Now I know them. The, the Ghost of the Dog Hester. That was Curse of the Collar. Uh, the Spirit of Rock and Roll is a good episode. But one of my absolute favorite episodes is The Computer Walks Among Us. Now that is a good episode. But hey, you be the judge in picking your favorite episode. I was thinking about doing a ranking, but I never got up to it. Anyway, after 27 episodes were produced and aired, each had, well, but there were 30 segments, because if I can see correctly, yes. Trying to have a better look here. Yeah, because some... Because later episodes... Well, now one episode in Season 3 had a had two separate stories, and one episode in Season 2 had three uh, stories blended into one episode. So after all that, a pub named Scooby-Doo came to an end in August of 1991 after four seasons were produced and aired. The show, however, did get to be rerun on the on the syndicated block of the Fantastic World of Hanna Barbera, but unfortunately, I have no recollection of catching on there. Because the only show I caught reruns on that block was Richie Rich. But anyway, the show had the show also got shown on Cartoon Network and Boomerang. But unfortunately, it was the only one of the old school Scooby Doo shows that never got shown the USA Network, though, unfortunately. Uh, even before they stopped showing the Cartoon Express. Oh well. The show has been released on physical media as well. It got released on video cassette as well as DVDs. And the first season's available, and the second, and third, the second, third, and fourth seasons are together. So, anyway. Yep. After that, Scooby and the gang were never seen again until over a decade later in 2002, after the success of the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, Scooby and the gang were back. And this time in a much more interesting series, What's New Scooby-Doo, which came on the WB Network. Well, well, I really wouldn't go high to do the tunes of the 2000s, but maybe I'll make an exception down the road. You never can tell. But anyway, a pop named Scooby-Doo, I do love it. It's my second favorite of the original Scooby-Doo series. Well, maybe not the original, but of all Scooby-Doo series overall, right behind the original Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Yeah. And right behind that would be What's New Scooby-Doo, and then the new Scooby-Doo movies and Scooby-Doo show. So anyway, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. So, why are you... Thoughts on a pub named Scooby-Doo. Did you grow up watching this show? I bet some of y'all did. I know I did. And I continue re watching in reruns. Well, growing up. So, 
and that's it. Just tell me what you thought about the show in the comments section below. If you like this video, click the like button, subscribe to my channel, and be a part of the Big D Nation. And if you like this, you may want to consider checking out these recent Saturday morning TV logs. If you'd like, go, go to the upper left-hand corner and see my Saturday morning TV log for what started the series off in Scooby-Doo Where Are You in the upper left-hand corner. In the upper right-hand corner is the Saturday morning TV log for the Scooby-Doo show, which I did earlier this month. Or if you want to catch what you might have missed or see it again, see Last week's Saturday morning TV log of Casper and the Angels in the bottom left-hand corner. And the bottom right-hand corner is the button you can click to subscribe. If you like rankings and reviews on movies, TV, music, video games, etc., then I'm your guy. Thanks for watching, and next week's Saturday morning TV log is... H.R. Puffin Stuff. So until next time, I'm the Big D saying, see ya.